Hello, hello. Thank you for being on here with me today. You have me, we don't have a guest, but you're my special guest. So glad you're here. We're going to be praying today. Of course, I'm going to be calling people out that come on here live. So that'll be really fun. But first, what we are doing, as promised, in case you follow us on social media, we put out a graphic for today, and we are going to be addressing the three things that we have to know for warfare, and most importantly, to win in warfare. And I've been digesting a few things here, and it's starting to just kind of settle in, so I'm not going to give you this full message per se, but I have this this incredible thing that has come to my mind as I'm reading the word, and I want to share it with you today. So thank you so much for getting on. I see Patrice is on here. Jeannie's on here. Jessica, Rhonda, hey, why don't you just share if, if uh, there's quite a few people out here on live on Facebook and YouTube, go ahead and share where you're coming from. Tell me your city and state or just your state or whatever. I'd be so interested to see who is on here today. Thank you so much for being here. This is going to be awesome. Okay, so before we get started today in this subject of warfare, I want to just say we are charging towards the capitals. The capitals, the call to the capitals, April 13th. This is so exciting. I am so excited. And I want to show you, I'm going to see if I can do it because it might not be as easy as I want it to be, to be honest with you. I'm going to see if I can show you one of our websites here, because I want you to see this. Uh, I might not be able to do it and do it with grace here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Let's see if I can do this, guys. All right. Well, you should be able to see this website. It is don't mess with our kids.us. And you'll see here that you can register to attend your capital right there. Now, if you're one of those people that say, I want to serve this thing, I want to mobilize, I want to see this thing happen in my state because I want to stand up for the family, I want to stand up for what's going on, then what you can do is um, go here and volunteer. Volunteer for your state. If you want to volunteer, they're looking for volunteers. And there's also downloadable, shareable graphics for your state. Let me share what I mean with this. So if you click here, you'll go into a Google Drive and every single state is listed. So I'll go down to my state because, you know, why not? And open up Oregon. Oregon has three different graphics in there right now. We're adding more. And if I click on this, I don't know if I'll actually show you guys. But let's see, maybe so. See right there. Okay, so this is can be a poster size. It can be a you know eight and a half by eleven, whatever. And this is right here in Salem, Oregon. But we have that for every single state. So that's pretty awesome, right? Other thing I want to show you is on this page you will see what is don't mess with our kids. This video right here. If you want to get this message out and you want to do this the easiest way, start sharing these videos right here. You'll see an explanation that there are people all over America. We've had enough because the attack on the kids has gone too far. There's a video about that. It's very, very short. And then you go down here to why does it matter? There's Erin Lee, her story about her daughter being invited to an after um, school art club. It was a 90 minute art club. You can listen to her story about what actually happened to her daughter. And it wasn't our club. It was something else. And her family went on an extremely challenging journey of uh, having her little girl who had just turned 12 years old come out of the indoctrination that she wasn't really a girl and she was a boy. And so watch this. This is only a minute. It took me longer to explain it than for you to watch it. It's really powerful. You can use these share buttons to share these. This one right here, this third video will set your hair on fire, okay? These are, this is actually a convention for the teachers of America. And this is the National Education Association. And it will show you books that are right now in the libraries of the schools in your city. It's not like some other school out there, but these are the books 
They're pornographic, a thousand percent pornographic, and they're in the schools right now. And you will see at this convention how teachers are being equipped to bring the indoctrination back to their classrooms. Okay. One of the things that we have to do right now that's very unpopular is to, you know, it's always unpopular to wake people up, right? Like my friend Tiffany Cummings says, it's like when people, when they first wake up, they're a little cranky. <laughs> so you might be like, Jenny, I don't want to wake people up because people aren't very nice when you say things like this, when you, you know, listen, the first response that I get from people is usually like, what, are you kidding me? Oh no, you know? And then we start talking about, we scroll to the bottom here, what people can do to get involved right here, prayer hubs. And they can come right down here, prayer hubs for families. Oh my gosh, I could go on and on about this. Our prayer hub was last night. It was absolute fire. It was amazing. We had all the way from four years old up to 77 years old. It was amazing. God did incredible things. These prayer hubs are fire. Got to start one of these and see God change things. And then the Esther Network, a lot of you are part of that. This is six prayers a week by audio. And you can, you know, put your AirPods on, go for a walk, go to the gym, maybe listen to it while you're cleaning, doing laundry, getting ready. These are powerful, powerful. And then here we have the call to the capitals. This is going to be so incredibly important. And I'm going to ask every one of you to sound the alarm, sound the alarm, because we're going to every single state capital, not we, I'll be in one place, but we have teams that are going to their state capital, all 51 locations. I say 51 because the 50 states and then Washington, D.C. And we have people registered right now in every single state. So we will have people there praying. Most locations will have worship. We're going to take communion. We're going to repent on behalf of our state. We're going to have possibly some states, well, a lot of states will do this, have elected officials that may come and talk about the um, severity of what's going on in legislation. We'll talk about other reformation strategies, and it will be a time where things shift in our nation and shift in your state. And so I want you to mark this day off. I'm so serious, like nothing else happening that day and take your family and start rounding up the troops, get them on the buses, drive the three hours to the Capitol, you know, to get a nice bougie bus, probably $45 a seat, get them on a bus, everyone pack their snacks, make something out of it. It could be so incredibly amazing and so much relationship built. You could have like popcorn prayer. You could do, I mean, share testimonies. You could, you know, share obviously fellowship and relationship. I see these buses and um, shuttle vans being actually a part of the strategy to glue together the army and begin to wake up the army of God. That's what this whole movement is about. It's about waking up the army of God. But if we just leave it to me and a couple other people, it's not going to happen. We need you. We need you to sound the alarm out of your voice. All right. Yes, Jenny. Yes, Jenny. We hear you. <laughs> All right. So right there, don't mess with our kids. Dot us. You know what? We present the opportunity to come to the Capitol, register there, volunteer. What is don't mess with our kids? Why does it matter? Um, whose kids are they? Oh man, you got to watch that video and share this one. And then here's the solution, pray fast and stand, get involved. I believe that we're going to see a great turnaround if there is a mighty engagement. And if you right now are saying, I'm engaging, that's me, I'm doing this, in the comments, write the word engage right there. Just put it right there. If you're engaged, I want you to put that. None of what we're asking people to do is actually hard. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Okay. So... There is another thing I want to show you. I don't know if I can find it, people. I would really like to be able to find this. We'll see. Okay. So how do I get out of this screen, though? I kind of got carried away here. Okay. Here we are. Awesome. Okay. So the other thing I want to share with you is the power of prayer. I have this pulled up somewhere. Um I don't do a lot of screen share with this program I'm using right now. So you just kind of have to forgive me here. Okay. Let me see if I can find it. 
You guys are awesome. Thank you for being so patient with me. I'm going to find this because I want to share this with you. This is a story of a girl who came out of the occult. All right. She's going to share the story of what happens when Christians pray. And let's just hope I can find it. I know it's in here somewhere. Yes. I think that's it. Hallelujah. All right. I hope that this audio comes through okay for you guys. Um, but let's see how this goes. It's very, very short. Listen to this. Because you were actually involved in this, in this cult mm -hmm. in attacking Christians, weren't you? Yes. Um, so we, so I was a channeler. Um, I talked to the demons and we, re they relayed messages to the rest of the cult through me. And their goal was really just to cause chaos. Um, but later on, um, I was 16 when, uh, I'm just going to say it, uh, I met Satan himself, mm -hmm. uh, which really obviously is shocking. Um, <laughs> and his priority for us, it changed the trajectory of the cult and we started attacking just Christians going after clergy specifically. Um, we had names, addresses, workplaces, um, and that's what we did. We just harassed Christians. Mm. So and that's <laughs> going on now, isn't it? I mean, that's, Oh yeah. Yeah. There are assignments on, uh, people yes. who are actively engaged in, uh, in worshiping and ministering, uh, mm -hmm. including now yourself. So we pray, we plead the blood of Jesus yes. Christ over you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that the Lord has victory because you realized uh, as this was going on that there were certain Christians or certain people mm -hmm. that would not be at the effect of of these uh, these prayer or these chants or these uh, right you know, these practices. Yep. So uh, I would actually travel in the spirit astral projection to um, influence. I don't know, lust or something on a Christian. And uh, in the spirit, I would see like a dome, like a blue dome over uh, groups of Christians that were praying or uh, just through the, all those experiences, I connected that we could not attack Christians as they were actively praying protection from God. Like there was a no-go zone, just no, absolutely no power. So that's, I love it now. Like, like, yes, <laughs> thank you, God. Um, but back then it, it made me very angry. It made the demons very angry. Um, and so at that point that made me curious how is this possible? How can Christians have this power to just nullify the demonics completely? So, uh, <laughs> uh, it, I, well, it's, it's the Lord's prayer, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. That will be done. And uh, leave me not unto temptation, but deliver me from evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, that Jesus gave mm -hmm. that prayer. And you're, you're testifying that, in fact, when we do that, pray the uh, uh, the enemy, God's enemy, the minions of demons and what have you, cannot affect us. Yeah, yeah, it's it's perfect protection. Nothing can get through. So uh, I take very great comfort in that now. <laughs> and um, yes, Satan is defeated. Yeah, he doesn't have any power. It's all an illusion, and. Uh, I wish more people grasped that. <laughs> oh, wow. Isn't that amazing? So the power of prayer. So I played this last night at our prayer hub and it just got us so fired up to just begin to pray. And we just envisioned that big blue dome over the top of us. And it was like, yep, devil take that because you cannot penetrate prayer. You cannot, not because of who we are, but because who he is. 
And the person that we're connected to is the victor. He came out of the grave. He defeated sin and death. He went down to hell. He took the keys. He took the authority. He came back and he gave the authority to us. Okay, so never downplay the power of your prayers individually and the power of prayer in your home. And that's why we say every home a prayer hub, every family a prayer hub. If you're a mother, you have a prayer hub. If you're a grandma, you have a prayer hub. And I want you to begin to imagine exactly what's going on in the spirit, which is warfare, which is what we're talking about today, right? So to start a prayer hub, it's super simple. You just go to hervoicemovement.com. I'll put that across the bottom there. So simple, hervoicemovementmvmt.com. Go there and just say, start a prayer hub. Boom, boom, boom. You'll be in it. You'll get our resources. We load up five coloring sheets every single month. We actually loaded up 10 this last month, but kind of feeling overzealous or something great like that. So 10 coloring sheets uploaded this last month. And the kids last night at my prayer hub, they're all around. Even the teenagers were coloring, right? Because coloring is actually pretty fun for every age. They're coloring. We have all these sheets out and we're praying and then we're all taking communion. We had the teenagers pray over Gen Z and it was really cool. Let me share this about prayer hubs. You can do something that I would call a hybrid blueprint. So some of you might want to just stick to the prayer guide. So we have 30 prayers and you can just say, all right, we're going to go around in a circle. Everybody take one prayer. Boom, boom, boom in a row. Super easy. And they just pray exactly as written. Or you know, the other side would be throw the prayer guide out and just go for it, off-road this thing and pray, but make sure that you pray over those specific categories because those are by design. We pray over Israel, we pray over the government, we pray over education, we pray over our community, we pray over the church, we pray over our local church, we pray over the family unit, and we pray over, you know, different spheres of culture, we take communion, we pray for each other. So it's organized in a way that you still want to pay attention to the categories. But here's a hybrid. You might want to uh, print off the prayer guide and then tell people in your prayer hub, listen, if, you know, how about you take this category, you take this category. And if you want to use the prayer guide, use it, just read. If you feel that you have something in you and you just want to pray and, you know, just go for it, man, get it done, right? So what I like about this hybrid is that if you invite new people over and most people are intimidated to pray out loud initially, I've never really met a person that was like, yeah, I'll pray out loud for the first time ever and not feel, you know, afraid about it. Usually people need help. And so, um, but also people like me, sometimes I'm like, Hey, listen, I'm just going to read this off because this has scripture in it. And this, this is connecting with what I want to say more than anything I have inside me right now. So then I just read it. So reading isn't just for novices. Okay. Because it's the word of God right? So it's like, you're, you're absolutely um, taking that sword and, you know, you're, you're wielding that sword against the enemy when you read it. But sometimes people have something within them and it just needs to be let loose and we haven't written it down. So I would say hybrid is provide the guide and then give people the leeway and the permission to use the guide or not. And then just stick to the categories. Now, last night we prayed for somebody's healing. That's actually not a category, right? We, but that's personal prayer for each other. We prayed over specifically some things that were not necessarily a category, but they fell under the categories. So we were moving prophetically over what to pray. I'm just telling you, it was electric. It was electric. I woke up this morning in the fumes of the glory of God. It was so awesome. So it stands to reason that one of the three, we're going to get into this now. You ready? One of the three ways that we come into a place where we can win in warfare is prayer. We do not want to warfare from a place of flesh or intellect. We warfare from not intellect, but intimacy, right? Not intellect, but intimacy with the Spirit of God. So we go into prayer where there's pressure. When there's pressure, we go into prayer. By the way, if you're only praying, like when things are bad, I'm just going to totally recommend 
that you get a daily habit of prayer. And for me, I have to set my alarm early. I'm, I don't, I like to sleep in. Okay. Um, so far my early rising habit hasn't like been woven inside of me in such a way that I just am like, Oh, I'm a morning person now. That's not happening. However, I do set my alarm in the morning. I get up and I go sit with Jesus and I sit with Jesus and feel his presence and get aligned. And I'm not coming with a big old, you know, like 87 things I need to talk to him about. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you're like, man, this is going on, Lord, you know, give me wisdom for this. And you're praying through some things, but get in oneness with God. So this is the first point today is to get in personal prayer with God to sit in his presence, do it early in the day. The enemy knows how to just like scoot that thing all the way to the end. And you're so tired at the end of the day. And then it's like, I'm going to pray, but then I fall asleep. I know it happens. Okay. If you get it in the first of the day, this is just Jenny's recommendation. Set the alarm. I wake up and I, I, I have um, a focus drink and it's hot and that's how I like it. And I sit down and I put my blanket around me and I just sit while the house is quiet before my kids wake up. And I just sit with Jesus Sometimes I have a lot to say. Sometimes most of the time I don't have a lot to say. I'm just sitting and I'm going through the Lord's prayer. A lot of times when I don't know what to pray in the morning, I'm going through the Lord's prayer. You know, our father who is in heaven, holy is your name. And that's my opportunity to say, God, you are above every circumstance. You are the CEO of my life and my personal affairs. You are lifted high above my personal affairs you are the one that commands order in my life. You are the one that sees chaos and you hover over it and you bring it into order, God. And so I use the Lord's prayer to guide me into my words because I'm still sleepy a little bit, right? Until that focus drink gets down and everything's moving like it should. I needed a template, which is the Lord's prayer. So look that up. Just type in the Lord's prayer. If you don't know the Lord's prayer, just Google it, Lord's prayer. And then I take those pieces and I just kind of expand on those, right? So our father who is in heaven, holy is your name. And I just stop right there and I meditate and I just praise him for being holy. And I just say, you are holy. You are majesty over everything. You are above everything. So this thing I'm walking into today, this thing is not above you. This thing is not intimidating to you, God. In fact, I'm asking you, Lord, to put your rulership over this. I'm, I'm thanking you for being holy in my life. I'm thanking you um, for being master over all of my children. And I use that moment right then to plead the blood of Jesus over every one of the family members, the seven Donnellys by name. I include myself over Jenny, over Bob, over Hannah, Samuel, Esther, Eden, Mercy, I go through and I imagine the blood of Jesus coming around just like the video we saw where there's that force field, right? That force field. And I imagine the blood of Jesus, like a force field over their cars, older ones are driving, a force field over their minds, a force field over their heart. The blood of Jesus is tethering them to the spirit of God today. And I just begin to just kind of express what I see. And I close my eyes a lot so I can see things and not be distracted. Oh, by the way, number one way to not get your prayer time in is number one, not setting your alarm early. Number two, it's bringing your phone into your prayer time. Um, that happens to me every time I bring the phone, I'm like, well, I'm using an alarm and blah, blah, blah. So this phone, what I would do is this because I kind of get lost in time. I'm not a time person. <laughs> For those of you who know me, you know that. So I have to set an alarm and then put it in another room that I can hear it when it goes off. So I know, okay. I got to get up and get moving, right? Because I can easily spend hours with God once I get in that place of quietness. Of course, my kids wake up and, you know, the hours thing would not happen as much because they need me. But time is hard for me. So I have to set an alarm, put it in the other room. Okay. But use the Lord's Prayer as a way to guide you in the morning to rise, shine, right? Rise, shine. The Bible says rise, shine. And so we're going to rise, shine. We're going to shine put the Lord above every circumstance, plead the blood of Jesus over your, over your family members. And then what I do is I start pleading the blood of Jesus over spheres of people that God has entrusted me to our ministry train, our church, the leadership at our church, the leadership at our ministry over the prayer hubs. We're praying for the blood of Jesus and for the spirit of God to break loose in prayer hubs and every leader. And we just begin, I just begin to like, you know, sometimes I have a, I have a map and I have different organizations. I go to my kids' church. I go to 
some um, of the ministries that we're connected to or just ministries that God's put on my heart and people that God's asked me to pray for. And so that's kind of my time just to be, you know, plead the blood of Jesus and the spirit of God move and energize them today and God ignite their dreams today, God, and just sever, we sever them from every assignment from hell. And I just, you know, I just kind of go, you know, there's no rule to it. I just engage. And so that would be point number one is engage in prayer on a personal level every single day. This isn't like once a week, my friends. This isn't like work your way up to once a day. I'm talking right now, engage. And everybody put engaged earlier because you're getting engaged in the prayer hubs. You're getting engaged in the Esther network. You're getting engaged in the capitals. This is awesome. So we're going to engage in personal prayer every day. If you have 30 minutes, man, that can change your entire day. If you have 10 minutes, that can change your entire day. If you have an hour, that can change your entire day. Zero time with God, I just don't recommend it, okay? I just don't recommend it. So get in prayer, use the Lord's prayer. You know, it goes to your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, okay? That's when I start seeing the plans of heaven where my life has been written out, the, the life of my children, the life of 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 the ministry and, and all our businesses and our finances, it's all, it's all held in heaven. And I say, God, your perfect plan on earth for all these things and for our nation and for my community and for our church, your perfect plans as it is in heaven on earth today, today, God, today, I don't need an off day. I don't want an off day. I want an on day. So this day has to be mirrored by heaven. What day is written in heaven is the day I want now in Jesus' mighty name. Okay. And I say, um, give us this day our daily bread. That's our daily needs. That's when I say, you know what, for myself and my family, God, give us energy. Give me faith, God, to believe these crazy things you've asked me to do. God, um, give me ideas. Father, would you give me the ability? to hone in that organization project that I've been putting off. I want to do that today, but I need help because it's not easy for me. I need you to help me and give me a grace that I don't feel like I've had. God, give me a grace for this. Or Lord, I'm having problems with this child and I can't find her heart. I mean, we're disconnected right now, God. Would you give me a way to connect? You know, the other day I was in prayer and I was praying this for one of my kids. and. He gave me a different way to connect. And it was a way that is super contrary to my personality. And so I was like, okay, well, that sounds good. But what about, and I was like looking for the like option B. <laughs> it's like, no, it's this. And so I thought, okay, Lord, all right. This is, this is different than my personality, but I'm going to do this. Because that child doesn't have my personality. They operate in a different way. And so God was like, I'm going to have you speak their language. I'm going to have you um, enter this relationship in a way that will translate to that child. And it might not translate to you, but it'll translate to that child. So these are the kinds of things, right, that we uncover in daily prayer. That's why you can get in for an hour and be like, wow, it's already an hour. I need more time, right? But use the Lord's prayer. Everybody type Lord's prayer, unless you're driving, don't be typing, but type the Lord's prayer because I want this to sink in. And when you type things and write things, it, it gets in. The Lord's prayer becomes a blueprint for prayer for you. Okay. And you might have, uh, go ahead and print it off, go to the Lord's prayer, print it off or open your Bible even better and look at it in the morning and just say, okay, let me spend some time in these categories. Now, maybe you only have 15 minutes to pray that day. Maybe it's just 10, you know, go through it and hit through these things. It even says in there to deliver us from the evil one. You know, thank you, Father, for your forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. The Lord's prayer is about like, okay, I can't go into this day holding a grudge against that person that really bothered me yesterday, right? Or bothered me two years ago and I'm still hung up on this thing. So the Lord's prayer walks us through. Nope. Nobody owes me anything. I, I let all accounts go. It also says, deliver me from the evil one. There's warfare in the Lord's prayer. Isn't that awesome? So we're going to engage personally 
in prayer and use the Lord's prayer as your template. If you're having a problem or a challenge, really connecting with God, it can happen. We're tired in the morning or whatever. Or we're trying to get onto our day. And so we, if, if we don't have this, it's like the Lord's prayer is your prayer guide. That's what it is. The Lord's prayer is your personal prayer guide. Okay. And then of course, let's take prayer to the next level. We're still on point number one, but prayer in community. You know, some of the people in my prayer hub are so incredibly anointed. There's a guy in our, in our prayer hub that he was sharing something last night, a word. And I was just like, my mind was blown. You know, it was only a couple months ago that we invited them to our prayer hub and they've loved Jesus for a very long time, grew up in Christian households, been going to church for a long time, but they had never been in a prayer group where it was like, okay, now you pray. Right. And we were reading the, the prayer guide at first, but then I mean, quickly, I was like, wow, this is the first time that you've prayed in a prayer group out loud and you're leading a part of prayer. Well, that's a ripoff to the kingdom of God because you have fire in you, you know? And so my point in saying this is how many people out there, their voices are not being activated in prayer because there's just not an opportunity. There's just not the opportunity. I'm asking you to create the opportunity to have a prayer hub. And I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity to have a prayer guide that still has fire on it, right? Because the fire comes. Now, here is what God shared with me last night at our prayer hub. He, he said, you know, Jenny, not everybody is flammable. Just make sure you are. So what does that mean? What is a flammable material? It's a material that if it gets close to a fire or a little spark gets on it, it's going to combust into flames and then it could cause a house fire or a you know, that kind of thing. So the Lord was sharing with me. He said, make sure that you're flammable, meaning when God comes in a, in, a, in a way that he manifests his presence in a fiery way that I'm flammable, right? Like, oh, I caught fire, right? So I just say, Lord, make me fire, make me flammable. And then once we catch fire, everything flammable around us is going to catch fire. So if somebody in your prayer hub doesn't catch fire, it's okay. Just you know, just pray for them in your private time, like make them flammable, like put material in their soul, in their spirit that causes them to just get fiery. God now fire. When I say that word is not a personality, it's literally hosting the electric presence of God on the inside and the fire. It burns off all impurities. It burns off all toxic things. Okay. So that's what the fire does. It purifies, right? Um, I, oh, I don't want to say this, but I'll say it since it's now top of mind and I've already mentioned it, but I know that I think one of my teenagers did this, but took a needle into the ear to do a, a hole piercing. And I think I did that when I was younger. Oh, I don't know. That's crazy stuff. I would never do that now, but I know that to, um, you have to boil or get it hot to get all the impurities off of it. And I think even some people like burn the end of a needle. I don't think that works very well. Anyway. You get the point. I think my analogy is breaking down, but you get the point that when you, the presence of God, right? When we allow ourselves to be consumed, we allow ourselves, being flammable is a choice, by the way. It's not like God, you know, lines up 10 people and says, okay, those two people, I'm going to let the fire of God hit, hit them. No, it is an inside job. It's an inside thing. It's a choice to say, you know what? I have 700 things up in my head right now and all these things I need to do. And, and I'm, Fear is the thing that presents us from being flammable. That, that's really what it is. It's fear. Okay, I have to get this stuff done. And, and my mind is preoccupied and I'm like scarcity. So I'm in fear and I'm stressed out. And life has a lot of pressure. See, that kind of fear is going to prevent any of us from being flammable. Okay. I remember being, um, I was at Angela's Temple, not for the Freedom Tour, but for, for Gen Z for Jesus. We took our kids and we were sitting in the back and um, I was back far enough that the music wasn't very loud. I was kind of in a, in a corner where the music didn't go into that corner. And I was kind of sitting there feeling very disconnected, feeling very unspiritual. And I knew that I wasn't flammable. Like the fire of God was in that place. And I was like, not on fire. Okay. So the first thing that we do is we confess. We tell the truth to God. We say, I'm not feeling the fire right now, God. So that's what I said to him. I was sitting in my chair. And, you know, you can only not be on fire for, for me a couple minutes, <laughs> but I've probably been there for 30 minutes, kind of distracted, helping kids, going in the hallway, doing all these things, but sitting there at one point going, 
I don't want to sit here all day and not be on fire. And God's in the room. So God help me. That's what I did. I told the truth, told God, I want to be flammable. What do I need to do? In that moment, he said, get on your knees, put your hands on this red carpet. So in Angela's temple, it's all red, red carpet. And that's how Amy Simple said she wanted it and never to change for the blood of Jesus. So I knew I was laying my hands down on a, on a covenant between Amy and God that the, the blood of Jesus, I put my hands down here and I said, okay, God, now what do you want me to pray? And instantly he said, I want you to ask me for the women who will fall on the sword to come into the movement, the women who will fall on the sword. And I knew that Amy Simple McPherson was a woman who fell on the sword. What do we mean by that? She wasn't holding on to her life unto death. This is what the Bible says that we overcome. Today's about warfare. It's about warfare. We overcome by the word of the, our testimony, the blood of the lamb. And a lot of people leave us off this third one and not loving our lives unto death. Meaning we don't self-protect and self-preserve and isolate and separate. We actually open our, our life and say, God, if I live a long life and I build your kingdom, it is to my advantage. But when I go to be with you, whenever that day is, it is to my advantage. So I can't lose. The only way that we can lose is to sit back, fold our arms, say, well, if God was really powerful, then I'd be on fire right now. And I, don't, I mean, that person, they're always on fire. That's probably their personality. It's just their personality to be on fire. So I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to like cross my arms here. And you wonder why the enemy has full access to slap you around, to suffocate you, to interrogate you, to stress you out. And life isn't that much fun for you. So what we can do here is say, I'm not going to hold on to my life. I'm not going to try to build a great reputation. I'm not going to have any fear of man. It, I don't answer to man. I answer to God. Okay. And yes, there are people in authority that we need to come under authority. So as my kids live in my house, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So my children come under my authority, right? But I'm an authority to them who's under God's authority. So the second you have an authority that's not under God's authority, you need to rethink that job, that workplace, that church, whatever, because we are not required by God to submit to authority that's not under God's authority. Okay, different topic. I don't want to get off track here. So let's review. Point number one of warfare is time with God every day. Pray. Get it out of your mouth individually and corporately. Have a prayer hub. Now, if your church has corporate prayer, go. Attend as much as you can in the larger setting. The prayer hub is a smaller, it's like the mid level, right? It's two to 10 people. And then the larger prayer that we do in our corporate settings and our churches and our communities, awesome and wonderful. Get in the game on that. And then if you're not flammable and the spirit of God is moving and you're kind of sitting there like, do, 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 then tell God, I am not flammable right now. There's something in me that's not awake. I feel very shut down. What do I need to do? He'll give you something to do. He might say, step out of the aisle and start pacing and praying. He might say, get on your knees. He might say, give me that problem that you're so focused on. It's become an idol to you. Maybe financial. Some of you might be thinking more about your finances than you do about God. And so the enemy has you. He has a shackle around you. And so God in that moment might say, I want you to turn away from that being your idol. And I want you to turn your eyes to me. I want you to look up, look at me, look at my face, look at my majesty, begin to tell me how um, in control I am of your life. I can't tell you how many times I've had to be re redirected by God. So many times and I'm so happy to be redirected, but you know what? He's a gentleman. He's so kind. But you know what? The second you tell him the truth and say, I don't feel the fire. I'm, I'm not flammable, God. You got to do something inside of here. What do I need to do? He'll, he'll redirect you every single time. Now he might say, I need you to raise your hands. You've never raised your hands before. He might say something that you actually don't feel comfortable doing. And you probably won't. But when you do, you'll be like, whoa, something happened inside me. Something's going on here, right? So pray, pray, pray. Be honest while you pray. Use the Lord's prayer as context and a template. Okay, so I have to get to this next thing because 
it is the, the reason why I even wanted to be on here on Word on Wednesday today because I'm so excited about this. So, um, oh, mm, let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. Because I want to end with this one. I'm going to give you number two. And what I was just going to share will be number three. Okay. You can tell I'm just getting this out for the first time. I haven't written this out. I don't have any notes. I'm just sharing what's in my heart. So number two, and then I'll get to number three, which I'm really excited about. I'm really excited about number two as well. It is this. What you agree with will become yours. What you agree with will become yours. So if I agree that I am a failing mother and the enemy has been throwing these dark, these accusations and yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're, your heart with your daughter isn't quite there and you guys are having struggles. It's because you're, you pretty much are failing at motherhood. You know, I heard that for many, many years. And I tried to resist it. I got offended when Bob was like, hey, are you going to make um, dinner? I heard him when he said, are you going to make dinner? I heard him say, you're probably not going to make dinner for the kids again, are you? You're probably like preoccupied and you probably don't really care. Like he, he couldn't say it right enough because inside of me, I had agreed with a lie. Well, how do you get out of that situation? Well, you got to confess. You got to go before God and say, man, I got some stinking thinking right now. I'm agreeing with I'm fat. I'm ugly. I'm a terrible mom. I'm a terrible wife. Nobody ever want me. I'm single forever. Who would have, I mean, obviously something's wrong with me. I'm single and I'm 36. No one ever wants to date me, blah, blah, blah. Okay. You're going to have to confess. You're going to have to come before God and you're going to have to say, um, I think I'm, I think I, I have some agreements up here. And how do you know if you are agreeing? with something that's not God, there's only one way, the word of God. If your truth statement that you've said is true, whether it's right or not, if it's like true, like I am a terrible mother. If I cannot find in the Bible, a place that says some moms are just really bad moms. I, if I, 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 and you know what? My Bible, I didn't find it. I didn't find anywhere in the Bible, in the word of God, that would agree that this is just it. I just pretty much suck at this, you know, and to lay it plain. And so because the word of God says that I can have fruit, I can have love, joy, peace, patience, that I have authority. That's what the Bible says. Lots about of authority. God was telling me, you're not agreeing with the mother I made and is inside of you, you're agreeing with the, with the circumstances, you're agreeing with the enemy, you're agreeing with the lies. So you need to get back in alignment that I made you to be a mother. Family was my idea. I said to um, fill the earth, to multiply, to multiply. And Jenny, you multiplied, you followed my command. And so it is my will that you would be a mother. And that you would be blessed and your children would rise up and call you blessed. And so I had to find in the word a few places that talked about victorious motherhood. And then you know what I had to do? Every time I heard that thing that you are a terrible mother, which by the way, was really tormenting because it's outside of my relationship with, with Jesus and my husband, me as a mother is the most closest to my heart. So the enemy was brutal. He was trying to rip me apart because if I felt bad about my motherhood, I can't come online like this. I can't speak to you with such strength and confidence because I feel like garbage in my personal life that I deem very valuable to me. So this whole thing about lies and agreeing with them is to get you to shut down. Okay. It's to get you to just completely shut down so that you cannot build the kingdom of God. It has major consequences. And then you miss your destiny. So we've got to get a handle on this and we've got to come before God and say, all right, what are the, what's the biggest lie I'm believing right now, God? And when he said to me, you think you're a bad mother and you're wrong, but if you live in the bad mother paradigm and belief system, what's going to happen is your children will begin to absorb your self-concept and they will start looking at you with the eyes that you look at yourself and you will actually breed a legacy of women who don't think they're good mothers and children who don't think they have good mothers. This is, this has major consequences to it. 
it's not just, oh, it's okay. I'll just suffer in my, you know, horrible mindset. It's okay. No, it'll affect your children. They'll actually look at you with those eyes and say, wow, yeah, my mom's not this. My mom's not that. They'll actually start seeing your faults in a massive way. And then when they have children, they're going to inherit it. They're going to inherit that. They're going to think they're not good mothers. So I knew that I had to get a handle on this. And this wasn't something that I could just be casual with. I'm not going to light a match, throw it on my couch and walk away and say, oh, it's just a little match. What damage could it do? Just a little lie. I'm, I'm not a very good mom. I'm not very domestic. I'm not very, you know, I can't do this. I mean, my, I'm not very, you know, I'm not as loving as I need to be. Just a little lie. It's not a big lie. It's not like, a, you know, bomb. Well, you know what? It only takes a little match to burn down an entire forest, an entire home, an entire neighborhood. And so God told me, this one's on you, Jenny. He said, I already stated the truth. You have to agree with what I said. And so here's the cool part. Two weeks, every time I would hear, yep, you're pretty much failing. So Bob would say like, hey, Jenny, are you going to go pick up, you know, the kids from blah, blah, blah. I would be like, wait a minute. Did you think I wasn't going to? And I was like, okay, hold on a second. Wait a second. And then I would say, no, I'm a really good mom. And I told him ahead of time, I said, I'm going to say this random phrase. I'm a really good mom. Even if you say something, don't, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. And for two weeks, I said, I'm a really good mom. Maybe I said it maybe a max of 20 times. And here's the thing. At that two week mark, I literally believed I was a good mom. And I've never, ever thought, and this has been about 10 years. I've never thought since that point in time that I wasn't a good mom. I thought, wow, I could have done that differently. Wow, I really blew my temper and I'm not going to apologize. And I've apologized so many times since then, but I didn't feel that I was a walking failure. That is different. I didn't, the identity and image wasn't failure. It was, wow, I could have handled that differently. So I'm going to go apologize and I'm going to ask God to help me with a new way. I'm going to apologize to God for treating his you know, child like that. And my child, I'm going to apologize to my child. I'm going to humble myself. And I manage things differently as I go. I still make mistakes, but those mistakes are not my identity. I'm not a mistake as a mother. I'm a very good mom. And I believe it now. So number one in warfare, better pray, hear the voice of God. Number two, the word, what does the word of God say? Agree with that. Come out of agreement, repent from all the lies, every bit of them. Oh, I'm doing this business, but I'm not really a business person. Stop that confession. If you want to see your business not go very far, call yourself a bad business person because you will bear the fruit. You'll bear the fruit. The Bible says that what you speak, you will eat the fruit. So we will actually live out the life that we are believing and saying. And so change all that. Change all that. How do we change it? Not by... Um, lying to ourselves about a positive thing, not by just a positivity gift, but looking at the word of God and saying, I choose to humble myself. I choose to believe the word of God is actually the truth, not my feelings, not what other people say about me, not the word that my you know dad called me when I was younger or whatever, whatever your case might be for you. You're going to have to work hard. See, I know a lot of people don't want to do the work. They just want God to have a magic wand and just boom. Oh, wow. I feel so much better. I'm, oh, I'm a good mom. No, I had to put in the work. I had to repent. I had to, I had to humble myself. See, pride is the glue to the lie. It really is pride. Pride says, oh, woe is me. Or, oh yeah, I'm just lesser than, or, oh, I'm just better than that person. Whatever. Pride is, is the sticky glue that sticks us to the lie. And humility is the thing, the solvent. It, it dissolves the stickiness of pride. It just, you know, humility says, I didn't set this thing up. God, you did. You told me to have kids. You said that I, my children rise up and call me blessed. You said it in the word. So I say it. My children are going to rise up and call me blessed. Right? All right. We've got to move on to the next thing because I only have a couple minutes. I have to be off on time today. And this is the one I was super excited about. And I'm going to share the shortest because it's really profound to me. Here's what it is. When I read, in 1 Samuel 30, I read about David at Ziklag. And what had happened was David and his mighty men came, the army of God, they came onto the scene at Ziklag and all the women and the children had been taken captive and they were missing. 
Now David went and pursued the enemy because of course these men are going to go after their families. But listen to this. I'm finding some keys inside the word. It said, and let me pull this up because I want to say it just like it's written. First Samuel 30 verse four. So David, now this is before they pursued the enemy. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Have you ever cried so hard that you don't even have any more tears? I know all of us have been there. Great anguish. Well, I am starting to discover places in the word where real men cry. And you know when they cried? Before they went and pursued the enemy. In warfare, I am convinced that tears are a weapon of destruction. Before we go into battle, there's a travailing of tears. Tears must come back to the body of Christ. And when we cry great anguish, like it's like our head, our heart gets connected and the great anguish of their missing wives and, and children, they stopped and they wept until they couldn't cry another tear. Then David said to God, do you want me to pursue them? Do you want me to pursue the enemy? And God came back pursue the enemy. And they went after the enemy. Then I'm reading in Nehemiah 1. And in Nehemiah, what do we see? Destruction. Jerusalem is totally destroyed. The walls are down. Everything looks like a disaster. It looks like a mess. Has your lives ever looked like a disaster? I mean, we had some stuff happen this week. We we're like, disaster, hmm, disaster. No, disaster. Wow. This is a disaster scene and they need to rebuild the walls. And the government in their time is not super excited about them doing this. The legislation is like, yeah, you're not going to rebuild. You'll never be able to do it. But here's what Nehemiah did before he started rebuilding the city. My city needs to be rebuilt. America needs to be rebuilt. That's why we're doing prayer hubs in the capitals because we're rebuilding. But here's the thing. Nehemiah cried and cried and cried. Read it. Chapter one of Nehemiah. He wept and wept and wept the great anguish in his soul over the state of his city gripped him and he wept and wept and wept and then he went and built back the city and the people came and they built back the city amazing right then god's like but jenny think about mordecai when mordecai heard that the what did he hear he heard that the jews we're going to be destroyed. And all of us think, well, not all of us. Some of us think that he just went to Esther and said, Esther, go tell the king, you know, you can stop this thing. But if you really read it and you go back, you'll see what, what Nehemiah did first. You guessed it. He wailed in public, in the streets. And the Jews, other Jews came out with him and they wailed a public cry. They put sackcloth and ashes. They tore their clothes. There was something so holy about tears that I believe that God wants to bring back to our homes and back to the public spaces. And great anguish is going to cause us to cry before we go into warfare. So Jesus wept. There's so many more stories. We don't have time to talk about them all. I do want to share this really cool story. However, if I can find it, where is it? Okay, listen to this. These girls, their names were Kate and Mary Jackson. And in 1910, they built, they ran one of the Salvation Armies. And the Salvation Army was opened, okay, it was started by William Booth. I'm reading this here on the screen. That's why my eyes are all over the place. So William Booth started Salvation Army. And these girls came to a certain location, Kate and Mary Jackson. They were officers of that corporation. They're credited to this day for that location. But the, here's the story. In this, it was in this poor city. Think about the state of America. Think about the state of our cities. Think about what's going on in the state of our schools where they spin and weave cotton into cloth. And the whole town was on the poverty level. There was lack. This is when Kate and Mary Jackson labored for a couple of years and nothing happened. 
Have you been laboring for a couple of years and nothing's happened? We don't want to labor and nothing happen over the next couple of years with what we're doing together, everybody. Those girls were diligently and went to bed exhausted at night. So they wrote William Booth. William Booth was head over the whole Salvation Army. They write their authority, their superior, their supervisor, their superior, right? This is what they wrote. Would you kindly move us to another station? We're so tired and disheartened. We've tried everything that we've been taught to do. Please move us to another location. Now, William Booth sent a message back with these two words, try tears. And they did. And they saw real revival come. Those girls went into travailing prayer, not just prayer, but travailing prayer, prayer with anguish in it. And this is what I want to share with you. Could it be that revival is going to come when you and I begin to connect with the heart of God over these children, over the ones, the boys who think they're girls, the girls who think they're boys, over, you know, maybe you have a child right now and you're like, I don't know what to do with them. Try tears. Maybe your finances right now are just looking very scarce. Try tears. Maybe you're looking at your city and your government. I'm looking at the state of Oregon and I'm like, God, what do you want me to do? And he says, Jenny, try tears. We are calling a fast. Please put this on your calendar. Please take it so serious. April 11, 12, and 13. After you leave your capital, break that fast. Okay. That evening. So really our fast would start on April 10th, technically in the evening. We are asking you to do the kind of fast that God wants you to do. I'm going to be doing a water fast. Some people do no water, no no food, no water. I don't know. I think that's what God's going to call me to as a water fast. We'll see. But in that fasting, let's not just like, you know, kind of grit down our flesh and go, okay, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat. Let's try tears. Let's begin to pray now. Let's begin to before go before God and 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 just get in touch with God's heart over the matters. And so I want to bless you right now with tears. I want to bless you with tears. And God, I'm asking you to bless me with tears. Would you just ask him right now? We're at the end of our broadcast. I have to jump off because I have more Zooms today, but I want you to just ask God right now, God, would you uproot any place in me that has become numb, apathetic, or distant, or hardened against whatever it is, God, that you want me to throw tears into God? And I believe that this is why it goes back to the first thing I prayed. We have to get with God in the morning. We have to pray, not just give him items to, you know, I I give him a lot of stuff and we do a lot of awesome stuff together. But when I come before God, we also want to say, God, what's your heart for my child? What's your heart for my marriage? You know, I was moved to tears just thinking about Bob the other day. I, 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 the Lord told me when you lay hands on him, I want you to, I want you to feel his heart right now and the pressure he's under. And I just began to weep and cry for him. And then the next night I had a dream and it was a dream that put me in a place of like, oh, wow, I need to, I, I, I have got to pray for my husband in a greater way. And, and the tears opened up another realm of compassion for my husband inside of me that I was really not aware of. So God, I ask you in the name of Jesus to bless everybody here with tears that's open to it, that's open to feeling your heart, God, that we wouldn't walk as zombies asleep and apathetic and distant and indifferent, God. God, would you uproot indifference? Would you uproot apathy? Would you uproot the places where we just manage things intellectually? We just manage our life as a manager and we haven't humanized, God, what's happening in our marriages and our families and our cities and our schools, God. I ask you, Jesus, that tears would begin to flow. God, help us. Help us, God. Help us do it. Help us do it, God. We need your help. And we repent, Father, for taking all of life's issues and stacking it right up here, God. We ask you, Father, to give us a grace that would allow, like, I just see like a trap door from the head that just falls open and it falls into our heart and into our in, into our souls, into our guttural places where we can cry tears again. God, we're asking you for the gift of tears to come back to us personally first and then to our family. And then to our community, our church is God. Help us, God. We know the tears break witchcraft. We know the tears break the stronghold of the enemy. We know the tears push back. We know the tears shift and shuffle and reorder things, God. We need your heart more than ever, God. We need your heart. We ask you to bless us with this. 
in Jesus' mighty name. Please share this broadcast today. There's probably somebody that you know that really needs to hear this, that will never hear this because they're not connected to this social media, this YouTube, this Facebook. Would you please share this? Just push the share button, send it on over to your social media. Thank you so much for being on here today. So excited about the Capitals. Go to don'tmesswithourkids.us and register for your capital. Please share those videos I showed you today and let's do this, you guys. Blessing you with tears and joy and wonder and faith and miracles. In Jesus' name, we love you so much. Bye-bye.